<laughs> Whether he's playing the blues or Mozart or Aaron Copeland, he lives up to his nickname, the King. It was November the 11th, 1936. The place, New York City, the Pennsylvania Hotel. Benny Goodman hired two black musicians to play regularly in his band. That was Teddy Wilson and myself. And uh, this was total integration for the first time. Why did he put us in, in the band? And Benny said, you know one thing? He said, it takes the black keys and the white keys, both, to make perfect harmony. Benny, when you were a young kid in Chicago, if you'd had the option, would you have chosen to be a classical musician or jazz? As it turned out, you'd do both, but yes, what I, would you have chosen no, at that No, I time? think at that time I'd have played jazz. I think I was much more interested in jazz. I'm sure I was, you know, you know because it was, uh, I think it was normal, you know, because it's, it takes a little while to um, understand classical music and, and either from listening or playing both. Well, I think at least it was so with me. This music you were playing must have sounded strange to your father. What did he think about it? You know, he, he died when I was quite young, unfortunately. Oh, he did? I didn't realize yeah, it was that Yeah, he was quite, well, I was, uh, I remember we were playing at the Southmore Hotel with Benny Pollock at that time. And it had to be about 1926, so well, I was 16 or 17. Oh, I think he was uh, quite gratified with the idea of, you know, him playing. He was. He was an old world figure. Yeah, and I thought maybe was, this yeah. kind of yeah. red hot Chicago jazz might have... No. Well, uh, I think he just liked music. And um, maybe I, at that time, I'd, you know, I'd played quite a bit, really. Mm. <laughs> that tells you my second comeback. <laughs> 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 he was quite a guy, I must say. Was, uh, he was very industrious and worked hard with anything, uh, whatever. I think he used to work in the stockyards one the time, you know, shoveling lard or whatever. And another time he'd, uh, well, he used to help cut those coupons because he worked in a, uh, well, a sweatshop, I guess. Hmm? They used to have coupons with the pants and the vest. Peace work. Yeah, peace work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Belonged to the Workingman's Circle. Was that what it was called? Yes. Workingman's Circle in Chicago. <laughs> My sister belonged to the IWW, Industrial Workers of the, of the World. The Wobblies. Wobblies, exactly. That's where it originated, I think, in Chicago. What was the working man's Circle? Was that something like a union? Something like a union, yeah, they'd give picnics and things like that. Mm -hmm. I remember that, yeah. You're yeah. <laughs> stirring up some kind of memories. <laughs> Go ahead, talk well, about it. Um, well, you know, he worked, um, and the next thing he worked at, well, but this time, I, for some reason, I went to the Lewis Institute in Chicago because... What's that? Well, um, it was a... Um, obviously of some kind of a college. And I think Flunky sort of went there to make up their grades and so forth. It was quite a good school. Uh, had a reputation. It's still part of Illinois Tech. It was a, a technology. And uh, I went there because, you know, a young Jewish boy had to have an education. That was the first thing. You know, music had to be some kind of a sideline. It was ingrained. And um, I did go as far as um, 
uh, grammar school. I went through high school for about a year, a year and a half. And by this time I was playing and making fairly good money because I went to Lewis Institute then because I could get later classes. And I was working until one or two o'clock in the morning at the Green Mill Gardens. If you had to pay for your tuition at Lewis Institute, you could take classes. But I said, I wanted to start at 1130 or whatever it was. Well, it did no good, you know, anyway, I couldn't. <laughs> but I used to sit there with Dave Tuff, the drummer. The drummer. Good drummer. And uh, we sat uh, two side by side at one desk, overcrowded, something like that. And uh, Dave was kind of... Um, Kind of smart, very bright. And I remember one time we had an examination. <laughs> and, uh, well, previous to this, you know, we'd sit there and bang, riffs and so forth. And Dr. Smale used to say, when, t when Goodman and Tuff are through with their concert, we will go on with the <laughs> class. <laughs> we'll do that again. What were the two of you doing? Whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, let me see that. <laughs> that. <laughs> you do it on the, on the desk, you yeah. see. If he lift off something. Well, it came time to the examination, and um, I didn't know a thing about this. But I think it was history. So, uh, Dave was writing, he did his exam. So I looked at his paper and I'd invert whatever phrases he'd say. He'd say something about Chicago was on the Chicago River or something. I'd say the Chicago River was the site of Chicago. <laughs> and so on for the whole paper. And uh, mm -hmm. sometime later, uh, Dr. Smale confronted the, <clears throat> the, um, the whole class and he said, I have two papers which are strikingly similar <laughs> with the owners. Please, please come up and claim them. And all eyes went to us. <laughs> so uh, we went up after class, and uh, he called me by the last name Goodman. You know that was it. Well, Goodman. Um, well, what you do with this for? I said, Well, you know, really, I wasn't really trying to get away with anything. I thought it was really more polite to really hand something in rather than just nothing on the paper. And it was convenient because Dave sat next to me and he knew some of the answers and so forth. Hmm. Then he said, well, uh, I understand you, you, uh, you play at a cafe or someplace. I said, yes, I do. He said, uh, do you mind telling me how much money you make? And I said, well, I make about $135 a week. And that time was really a gigantic salary. So he said, really? He said, you know something, Goodman? You keep on doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you were making more than he was. Oh, I, I must be making three times as much as he was making. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, we were a rather a civilized um, school at that time. Remember, if I can tell this on television, it were to, uh, was this Dr. God, I think it was Dr. Smale. He said, he asked the boys, I don't know if there were any girls in the class, but he's, they were talking about sex for some reason, a long time ago. And he said, is there anybody in this class who hasn't masturbated, see? And I think it was a Jewish-Russian boy he got up right away. I have it, you know, like that. He said, really? He said, you don't go outside in the hall and try it. You don't know what you missed. <laughs> Dave Tuff was sitting beside you at, in the school uh, yeah. at the desk. Was he playing in the same band with you? Well, no, I don't think so. He was with the Chicago gang, you know, Bud Friedman. Yeah. Bud Freeman and Eddie Condon, Jimmy McPartland, uh, supposedly the Oak. They were ready for the whole, well, they called them the Chicago Gang, and uh, uh, Gene Krupa. Well, of course, it couldn't have been either way. It had to be one or the other. And we used to play at school, I think. Mm. We'd get a little jam session going there. So. Talk about the 1938 Carnegie Hall concert. Uh -huh. yeah. Just tell, tell all you can remember about it. Well, I think 
remember that very <laughs> vividly. It was really a press agent's dream. His name was a um, Wynne Nathanson. And the first time he approached me, I said, you must be out of your mind. I said, well, probably we want to do with Carnegie Hall. You know, we were used to playing for people who dance. They're part of the scene. You know, just to play a concert. Uh, what you know, you can do that with Beethoven or something like that. I don't see how you can do it with King Porter Stop or what we're doing. Well, he said, no, we can do it. I think you should. Well, in any event, um, we were going to play Carnegie Hall. It was booked, and they got. Sal Hurok to put his name on the program. He had nothing to do with it. What, to make it respectable? Respectable, you see. And uh, I remember he sent me a letter. It's <laughs> really funny. He said, now don't forget, Benny, please have the boys dressed appropriately. You're playing at Calling Carnegie Hall. <laughs> As if we didn't dress, you know, appropriately. And uh, it was rather funny when you look at it. And uh, I was really kind of, um, um, I was a little wary of this thing. So um, I remember g getting a hold of B. Lilly. Um, and I asked her, I went to see her, I guess I forget what hotel she was at. I s asked her if she would, you know, sort of relieve the music with some comedy or whatever. Well, she was bright. She said she didn't want any part of it. <laughs> And, um, and then when it came time to get tickets for my family, I couldn't get a seat. They coming in from Chicago and places like that. I don't know. What, I think I had to pay scalpers prices. The house was sold out. Oh, yes, yeah, completely. Well, I suppose they could have sold it out for five days running or something like that. But we did. Uh, uh, we sort of paid attention. We always paid attention to everything, as a matter of fact. We... We rehearsed there for about two or three, two or three times during the week, just to get the feel of the hall, you see. And um, so it came at the time of the concert, and I don't think, I'm sure, we weren't uh, uptight, not at all. That band was pretty confident, and, and uh, probably I wasn't. I didn't know enough. <laughs> I didn't know what we were doing. You know, it was important, but, you know, it's Carnegie Hall, all right. So we played, and uh, that, it was an unusual band in the sense that, you know, it was so well rehearsed and so, uh, it was so technically polished and so forth. It was just a question of if they were going to play or not, like a good football team. Well, they had a good night, so so, whatever it was. Even their so so wasn't bad, you know, they good. And I could tell they quickly, you know, by the first or second number, whether the band was on, so to speak. And um, I heard the first number, and I said, well, this is going to be good tonight. They were on. They were on. They were on. And uh, as you know, the rest of it is, um, is a rather historic story. It's a piece now. of American history. Yeah, it is, yes. It is the biggest selling record uh, in the history of jazz. I guess it was, yeah. It is. Well, still sells. Package, package. package. Right. There's a package. It still know? sells. Sure, of course it does, yeah. But it didn't, we didn't uh, plan to make a record at all. And that only came about. Oh, I, I heard some. Tell me about that. Didn't, wasn't that a sort of accident that it ever got Maybe, on the record yes, at all? Yes, yes. Tell me about that. Well, um, it was about uh, two or three days later, I was walking. Um, Fifth Avenue or someplace, and I ran into a fellow named name Albert Marks, who was married to um, uh, Helen Ward, who wasn't with us at this time. She'd gotten married. And, um, oh, he said to me, had, did you make an air check? I think you know what an air uh, check. He used to make the a air recording. Yeah, uh, acetate records in those days. Right. You know. I said, oh, God, no. I said, I've got so many in my... Uh, room at the Pennsylvania, it's just lined with, I know how the band sounds, especially the numbers we played. Well, you know, he said, I thought it was um, quite, an, uh, quite an occasion, and I had it recorded by uh, Mark Warner. At that time, had a little recording He had studio. a band himself, one time. Of course he did, yes. Um, and he said, I had it all recorded. He said, would you like a copy? I said, no, I don't. And then I said, well, you know, it might be fun to kind of have one. So he sent me this 
box, this tin box of all these uh, acetates record. Um, and they were um, kind of material that was very fragile. You know, if you put it next to heat, it would melt. It's lacquer. What, is that what it was? Yes. And so I had it in, um, well, I know, went from my apartment to wherever I was, and one of those things that always showed up, kind of there alone. And um, there was some time later, quite a long time later, it was about 1950, that's 12 years after the concert, and um, we were living on Park Avenue, some, we had a big 15-room furnished apartment. I think it cost $300 a month. Nobody wanted them in those days. And uh, we were moving out for some reason. Well, I say we, my, my family, Alice and the children, well, of course we had, between us we had five children, uh, three ch stepchildren. And uh, so my uh, sister-in-law, Rachel, Rachel, Speeden at that time, asked if she could have the apartment uh, and sort of continue to pay us rent because by this time it was kind of a buy because it was rent controlled. So we made that arrangement. And then she called me after she'd been in about a week or so and said, uh, see, Benny, the owner, there's a tin box of something, I think it's records, and uh, I think you should come and get it because if uh, Dougie, meaning her son, if Dougie gets to him, you know, he's going to play him and, and uh, maybe he'd lose him, etc. And, uh, oh, I said, my God, those records again. So I went over and got them, and I said, well, you know, I better do something about this for some reason. I, so I called a couple of friends of mine, John Hammond and Frank Conniff. Remember him? Yes. Uh, yes, he was some Hearst kind of, newspapers. That's right. He was quite a fan. And I called him for some reason. He was very close. I knew him very quite well. He used to come in. And um, I think my attorney, and I said, I called him. I said, let's go and listen to these things. It might be funny. <laughs> and uh, so we went to a place called the Reeves uh, Sound Studios. Mm -hmm. And now the advent of tape had happened. Um, uh, so he started, whoever it was, playing these uh, acetates, and this music came out like gangbusters, you see. And so I said, well, look, you better stop right now, after one side. I said, uh, as long as you have this tape machine, you might as well put it right on tape. That may be the only play we get out of this. I don't know what these are. You can't are. play them many times. Not many times. So he took them all down, and we were listening all the time, on tape. and. Of course, certain things that we can only play for, say, six minutes or eight minutes, on a record, sing, 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 were now 18 minutes. But this was very simple on tape. We just patched it up and it went on. And so now I had this whole uh, uh, box of tapes, or now I had this so forth. And I knew what was Good. Nobody was going to tell me anything else. And you know, when you have something good like that, you, you, you want somebody who really appreciates it to be part of it. And I think I, if I'm not mistaken, I offered it to some record company who I was with at the time. I won't go into the names. It was rather um, offhanded about it. So I said, well, that's that. And I went to Ted Wallerstein, who I knew quite well. Uh, Columbia Records. Yeah, he was at Columbia at this time, which uh, I'd more or less just started a new company, fairly new. Well, he was bowled over by these, and so we just made a deal very quickly, and they're still selling. <laughs> well, it was just happenstance, really, that uh, Albert Marx just met me on the street. Uh, well, that record almost got lost. Uh, completely. And you know, there was only one microphone in the, in the whole Carnegie Hall. And I've heard since then, uh, a lot of, um, well, the last person uh, was David Bowie who listened to this, you know, I said, my God, it's terrific. And somebody said it was down at one microphone, and he couldn't believe it because, you know, they use it, I don't know, 40 tracks at least. During the playing of, I think it was Sing, Sing, Sing? Yes. When Jess Stacy played his famous little solo? Yeah. Tell about that. Well, it's a simple explanation, I guess. We had some very uh, 
stalwart people, to say the least, you know, like uh, Harry James. Yeah, and, also, then I want you to tell me, as best you can remember, who was in the band at that time? Well, at that time it was Harry James, uh, Chris Griffin, uh, uh, Ziggy Elman on trumpets, Vernon Brown, I think, on trombone, and still Red uh, Ballard. Uh, it was a small band of five and four saxophones with behind me shirts there. Babe Russell was on tenor, I remember, at that time. And again, I lost track of the mm. two elder players. My brother Harry, Gene, Jess Stacy, and uh, uh, Alan Bruce on guitar. And of course, the quartet now with uh, Lionel Hampton and uh, Teddy Wilson. Yeah. Uh, well, getting back to uh, Sing Sing Sing, well, here were these sort of stars. Well, they were. Harry James by that time, Gene Krupa, and just Stacy, and uh, not just Stacy, I mean, uh, not in the forefront anyway, uh, Teddy Wilson. And everybody played a solo, and we used to, I don't know, it was always sort of um, occasionally Jess would play. I think Gene gave him the cue. He said, Jess, you know. And he gave him the cue that night. And then he played. And he played about for one minute or so. And I said, my God, you know, he's stealing the whole show. <laughs> little boy from Sedalia, Missouri. <laughs> and he did practically with that, with that piano solo. Well, if you, solo. if you want a layman's opinion, he didn't steal the show. What was astonishing about it was that he had never played that way before that anyone could remember. And he played about a minute of the most heavenly yes, he improvisation. Yeah. And musicians still talk about it. Exactly, yeah. Well, he played that. Uh, he played that piece, uh, or he played that solo at the hotel, which we couldn't ever record mm -hmm. because we didn't have tape in those days, mm -hmm. you see. But at the Carnegie Hall, concert, it was recorded on this acetate. And um, as you say, probably never played it that way. Never did. No. It was heavily, as you say. Mm -hmm. Let me name a few other bands and ask you how yours differed. Mm -hmm. You want to do that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's late enough. Yeah, it's late enough. <laughs> Tommy Dorsey? Well, very good band. Very good band. Uh, well, of course, he had the strings, and he had a great arranger, Cy Oliver, and at that time he had um, one of his best bands. He had uh, uh, Buddy Rich, and I think Ziggy was with him then, and Frank Sinatra and the singers, the Pipe Pipers. It was a great organization. It really was. Another clarinet player, Artie Shaw. Yeah. Well, Artie was uh, very good. He had a good, good band. I don't think his band really ever was a swing band. What? No. In retrospect, it never was, was it? No. Not a real swing band. No. But it was a good band. Very good. And he was very clever. Well, I'd known Artie for years. And um, <laughs> we used to play on some radio shows before that. And, oh, he lived in, I think, New, New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania. He was, he was an oddball. He always tried to be. And uh, he played something for me. I, I think I played it before he was going to show it to me. <laughs> Glenn Miller. Well, Glenn was the last person in the world I thought was going to lead a band. Why? Because, he, you know, he had the most trouble playing that trombone than anybody in the world. He wasn't very good on the trombone. No, it was, you know, it was, it was sad. He, he, you know, when you compared him to Teagarden and Tommy Dorsey and uh, whoever, you know, poor Glenn, he used to struggle with that. But he was, he was bright. He always had good ideas. And uh, I do remember that... Um, he came to me in Texas. I was playing this. This was some time later after I sort of arrived. And he came up to my hotel to see me, and the poor guy was struggling. And he said, you know, Benny, what do you have to do to 
make it. And I said, Gee, I said, Glenn, I have no slightest idea. I, I don't know what it is. I said, but I'll tell you one thing, don't quit. <laughs> and he did make it, you know. I don't know if he ever took my advice. But I knew Glenn very well. As a matter of fact, I gave him the money, bar, you know, loaned him the money. He told me this later, to get married. He, uh, he went out to marry Helen in um, Boulder, Colorado. That's where he's from. But um, uh, I drove him to Chicago. I think we stopped off and saw Ben Pollock someplace. He was playing in Detroit. I had a little Ford. And then, uh, well, how I knew about me lo him loaning the money, but many years later, after he was a success and played at the, um, what was the place up in Westchester? Meadowbrook? No, Westchester. Well, I'll get back to it anyway. It was very popular. Wasn't Frank Daly's Meadowbrook? No, no, West? that's New Jersey. Is it? No, no uh, that's Glen Island Casino? That's it. Yeah. Glen Island Casino, see, and, um, and, uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this story. I thought it was kind of amusing. He came up to see me, and, uh, he, and uh, after the show, we went up to have a drink. Helen was there, his wife. And he said, uh, well, here's that money I owe you. I said, what money? <laughs> oh, I had no recollection, not a ounce of recollection about this thing at all. And he paid off. Well, that's the kind of a guy he was. He was really a gentleman, an honest fellow, and... Um, Quite, quite a disciplinarian, I found out. All right, now you raise that point. I want to pursue it. Um, you had, I think, by common agreement, the most disciplined, tightest dance band, jazz band, whatever you like to call it, anyone ever had. The reed section, for example, mm -hmm. had a perfect attack, mm -hmm. perfect discipline. How'd you do that? You must have been pretty rough and tough at times. I guess I was. Um, well, first of all, I guess you have to know what you want. And somehow explain that to people in the band. That if you're going to attack a don't do it. Don't be haphazard about it. I think it was just basic kind of musical uh, qualities. Just basic. I don't think there's any mystery about it. That kind of thing. Of course, that band did very well. Yes, it did. Very well. And, of course, they also blended. It was necessary to blend. You couldn't go off on another tangent. The first saxophone player was the first saxophone player. You had to um, uh, play close to the same vibrato, vibrato. You had the intonation had to be correct. The sound of the instrument had to be correct. You had to follow him. Yes. And uh, although you say it was, it was a very disciplined band, but it was a wild band on top of it. You see, when you are disciplined like that, then you can do anything. Like learning the rules before you break them. Exactly. You can do anything, you know, and everybody knew what everybody did. Everybody waited for everybody. You know, there was no encringement on somebody else. You know, everybody knew each other. It was quite a band. You know, I was listening to one of those records. And it was a wild band. <laughs> they were, they'd take off, and I said, my God, they're going to temple. They're never going to make it. <laughs> but, you know, they did. You've played and recorded a great many tunes. Mm -hmm. Which, do you have a single favorite? Well, that's very hard. We'll name two or three or four that you like the best. Two or three. Well, I like, uh, I like, uh, I think the Fletcher Henderson arrangements, he was so, so great. And so, so, simplicity itself, only in the best, best possible way, you know. I remember I asked him, I said, uh, Blue Skies. I asked Fletcher, I said, Fletcher, you know, I've never understood why you had that or introduction on uh, the arrangement of Blue Skies. He, went, he had the band screaming, clarinets and trumpets. He said, well, you know, Betty, he said, uh, that introduction, he said, that's... Uh, 
That's the storm before the blue skies. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful description. No, he was quite a cultivated gentleman, Fletcher was. And his wife, Leora, had one of the best manuscripts. She copied all those. It was really beautiful. As a matter of fact, they're going into archives now, the ones I, I didn't loan and never got back and so forth. But anyway, his arrangements of that, uh, the King Porter Stomp, Sometimes I'm Happy, and some of these pop songs he made for us, A Glory of Love, and um, what else? Well, I don't think Goody Goody was one of his arrangements. I don't know what that was. Um, that wasn't a good enough song no, for him to arrange. No, no, he wouldn't. He didn't make any. He didn't arrange any songs he didn't really like. And there's no way you were going to get him. He was right mm -hmm. about that because you know everybody plays songs now. They supposedly swing, what whatever it is, Cole Porter. You know those songs don't swing by nature. And there's no way you're going to make them swing. They're good. They're very good, but they just don't have that quality, you know, except some. Lady is a Triumph, and uh, quite a few you can name. You know, but some of the other ones are, were basically kind of romantic songs, you know. But I think everything he did, and, um, oh, <laughs> God, there were so many songs that we played over the years, you know. Madhouse, Swing Time Stealing in the Rockies, apples. Stealing, Stealing apples. apples, that was one of his. And uh, Notes to You, the clarinet mm -hmm. solo he did, you know. But your favorites are Sing, 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 King, Porter? Yeah. And what else? Well, I would say Sometimes I'm Happy. I think that was a, a beautiful arrangement. Mm -hmm. you know? And there was nothing sentimental. Blue skies. About. What? Blue skies. Blue skies. Awfully yeah, good. It was a great arrangement. Yeah, wrapping it up. Um, down south camp meeting. Mm -hmm. It was interesting about that band. You know, it was never. There was no sentimentality. There was sentiment, but no sentimentality. There wasn't any kind of sweetness about that. That you. It was. Uh, it was something else. It was very classical in a way. I think it's, in a sense, as I've grown up, it's the way you're supposed to play classical music. Well, I want to ask you that. Yeah. You are an um, expert in both fields. Well. Tell, well, okay. Okay. Now tell me, why is not good dance band music, 14, 15, 16 piece band, why is that not, why cannot that call be chamber music? What's the difference? Chamber music is music for a small orchestra. Well, that's not too small an orchestra, is it? Uh, Fourteen pieces already. Um, well, you could, in a sense, if they play well and play well together. But well, I think you played well chamber, together. Of course we did, yes. Um, well, there again, well, the only thing I can uh, uh, tell you is this. Um, just recently, I played chamber music with the Amadeus String Quartet. Mm -hmm. One of the, I think, probably you'd say the greatest quartet mm -hmm. in the world. You know, we had one rehearsal, and we played at the Aldeborough Festival for this uh, Mozart uh, quintet. And we, uh, BBC recorded it and uh, showed, played it over the air. And I'd never met him before. I heard about them. I sort of insisted they play with me. Uh, all I can say is that they were this kind of a group. You know, they played uh, unbelievably together, but still with uh, um, aggressiveness. You can't play Mozart without aggressiveness after you know it. You can't. It's as dull as dishwater. When everybody taking his time on slow movements, it seemed like he could play one bar for 15 minutes, you know. And so you follow him, you know, if he's doing the right thing. Mm. Uh, well, that's, uh, I guess that's real music, you know. Well, music is music. My yeah. reason for my question, 
Chamber music, what we call chamber music, generally was written in the late 18th century for small court orchestras, mm -hmm. 12, 14, 15 pieces. I don't know if they call that chamber music. I think when they talked about chamber music, they talked about... You think it was trios quintet, and quartets? Quintet, yes, yes. Well, that, I, I think they're both, aren't they both called well, chamber music? Well, they could be, yes, if they're small enough. In any yes. case, these are small compositions well, mm -hmm, written for yes. small orchestras. And no conductor. For, no con playing for the dukes and the counts and yeah. the kings mm -hmm. of Europe. Yeah. So, would not a band like yours have played modern chamber music? It's a small orchestra compared to a symphony, 10, 12, 15 pieces. Think about it. I think it is. Well, the way they played, you're quite, quite right. Because they had the cohesion of that kind of a group. And if they played something valid, when I say valid, uh, almost kind of in a classic sense, like an arrangement by, by um, um, Fletcher Henderson. Fletcher Henderson. Which is very simple, but very difficult. <laughs> very difficult. Well structured, well, complex. Complex, yeah, everything. If you were starting out today and wanted to start a dance band, could you find that kind of musician now? the kind you found then. All the young people now want to play guitars. I know that, yes. Gee, I don't know to start with. I don't know, but you know, I always uh, think about these people all being mavericks. Nobody else wanted them. Nobody really wanted Harry James. Nobody wanted um, Z.L. really. Gene Krupa, or myself included. Well, what do you mean, nobody? Who didn't Well, I mean by that, uh, it wasn't very difficult to get them. We were banned. In the first place, there weren't any bands of this kind. So, oh, Jess Stacy, Peyton Sloan's, <laughs> you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, Teddy Wilson. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder how I got that kind of a band together. And you ask whether it's possible now. I, I would never attempt it. The first place I know too much about it. <laughs> You've seen it. I know too much about it, and you've got to be patient. I don't have the patience. Well, that might answer the, a question I have for you. Yeah. In one form or another, even when their leaders are no longer here, a number of bands have continued to go. Mm -hmm. Duke Ellington with yeah. his son. Yeah. Count Basie is still leading his own yeah. band. Mm -hmm. Harry James, until he died not long ago, had his own band, kept it going. Mm -hmm. The old Glenn Miller, so-called Glenn Miller Orchestra, was somebody else in front of it. Mm -hmm. Tommy Dorsey was somebody else in front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Woody Herman is still He's still, playing, still yeah. got his band going. Uh, Buddy yeah. Rich has got a a big band. Mm -hmm. How come there's no Benny Goodman? I mean, how come you're not up there stomping and blowing a clear? You could you could do it today as well as you could then. You may not want to. <laughs> Tell me why. Well, I'll tell you, the first place I, um, uh, as you pointed out, if I had the big band, it would have to be the quality uh, that I don't think I would. If it was the quality, then you have to rehearse and you have to play together. You have to play together every night. I, I just can't do that. Can't do that. I don't know if I have the stamina to do that. And, you know, I, I've known, I know a lot about in music now, intellectually, that I didn't know then. I know how to explain it, but that doesn't do any good. The players have to do it. They finally have to do it. You see, and you have to wait for this. You know, I don't think there's any, and that's something, you know, that's gone. Everybody does everything very quickly nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a different world. And there's very few people you can kind of uh, do that kind of thing. If it's an Am Amadeus string quartet, but it's always been true, but people forget it. I, whatever you do, you know, everybody has a series of concerts, series of this, a series of this, and a series of this, and, you know, they have one-hour rehearsals, and you have regulations. We didn't have any of that kind of thing at all. We were our own masters. We did what we wanted to do. You did it your way. I did it our way, absolutely. Even record days, we'd go in to record. And uh, things didn't work, which could happen. The band was very good. 
if you know, nothing was happening, <laughs> said, go home. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Well, you know, this would be absolutely scandalous now. You'd have the, all that 21st floor coming out. What's going on? You're wasting our money. <laughs> so it's not your money, it's my money. <laughs> when Harry James formed his own band, mm -hmm. he had a singer named Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. James wasn't doing too well for a while. Mm -hmm. And Sinatra left, went yeah. to Dorsey. That's right. Would you have wanted him? Did you try it? To hire him? Well, you know, uh, Frank sang with me at did, the, no, one of no. his first appearances at the Paramount Theater. Because Bob Whiteman, who was running the theater at that time, came to me rather, uh, as I look back on it, rather apprehensively, and he said, uh, Would you mind if um, uh, Frank Sinatra sang with you on this uh, engagement? You know? And I said, well, no, not at all. I, well, I didn't know very much about him. I said, not at all. So he sang with us. I think that was the first start of his, you know, some kids were kind was of... He not, was that before he signed up with Harry James? Oh, no. When was this? Well, I'm trying to think. I think he after started he, with James, went to Dorsey, Dorsey, and then I, went off on his own. Oh, well, I think it was after he left Dorsey. Mm. I think, I'm really kind of, but it was his first appearance at the Paramount Theater mm. was with me. And he What sang. did you think of him? Well, frankly, he didn't knock me out. <laughs> 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 he didn't at that time. I know, he kid's good, you know. He didn't knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the second best clarinetist around? Whom do you admire? Whose playing do you like? Well, I like a lot of people. I like to say mostly. Uh, well, uh, mostly classical players. Reginald Kell. Well, he was quite good, very good, quite a, a technician too. He understood the clarinet, knew a lot. He was a very good teacher, very good. And there's a lot to know about a clarinet, mm -hmm. very lot. Quite a bit to know. And uh, there's um, Leister, he's a German clarinet player. And um, gosh, I can't think at the moment. The jazz players, nobody's playing jazz anymore. I got a, le I got a, re I got a record from a kid in Norway the other day, just yesterday. And my secretary opened up, and she said, "Well, I want you to listen to this tape." And it was a kid who copied me, but you know, but in his own way. And he wrote a very intelligent letter, asking a couple of questions, which I haven't answered. I have no time to. But he was excellent. He was good. He was good, and he had a good rhythm section. I think sometimes much better than what some I've had recently. <laughs> well, Benny, you are not retired. You're still working, no. and we'll continue to work, for which we are thankful. But we hear of retired movie stars who like to sit home at night and look at their old movies. Do you ever play your old records? Oh, occasionally. You no, know, I'll tell you when I play them. If I want to uh, have something, uh, um, or some kind of indicator uh, to go by of, of quality, uh, or how something should be played, I was. I have a young girl working in my office who picked out uh, some uh, tapes that I'd made recently, say, not recently, even some time ago. But they were a duplication of something I did originally with the old band. You know, she was knocked out by Locke Lomond. Uh, but this was fairly recent. It was kind of a different band. And something else, I forget what it was, with Martha Tilton singing. And so I said, well, that's pretty good, but I said, you, well, Wendy, you better listen to the original record, see. <laughs> she put the original record on. Boy, she, she said, my God, you know, it's a, it's a completely different cup of tea. You can't put that out, you see, if somebody's heard of that. Mm -hmm. That's when I listen to these things. To you be know, sure we, it's up to your standard. That's right, completely. And you know the people... People recognize that, and they won't buy records that are not up to my standard.
Toward the end of what is now called the big band era, uh, Dorsey, for example, put in a string section. Mm -hmm. Artie Shaw put in a string mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. You never did. No. Really, I never liked the idea. For me, that is. I didn't know what to do with them. Because I, there again, I didn't have that kind of a band where you could incorporate strings. I didn't, you know, you, you, strings were like foreigners. I didn't know them personally. I didn't know what can they do. But they haven't anything to do with jazz, except the Amadeus Queen Quartet, and they wouldn't be good in my band. What are you going to put them in King's Porter Stump? <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't. No. How about playing a little something for me? Oh, for I the, forgot about for that. Well, you know, I can't play. But I haven't played, but I'll... Well, you haven't been... Wonderful. Thank you. Well, <laughs> when are you going to pick up the horn again? This fall and go back to work? No, I think uh, after li listening to what I just did, I better pick it up pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to play every day to keep your lip together. Yes, you do, and your fingers moving. Mm. You really have to. Thank you. That was lovely. <laughs> Benny, you went, tell me about starting the uh, uh, first the trio and then a the quartet. Teddy Wilson first. Right. Uh, uh, who is... Um, um, I was told about it by John Hammond, mm -hmm. who I think, if I'm not mistaken, he'd been playing with Benny Carter, and John heard about him, and he was a brilliant piano player. And then we, we got together one day, uh, uh, Teddy and I, at Red Norvo's house out in Long Island many years ago. At home, at a party. That's what? what? At a party. Yeah, at a party? Just a small party. Mm -hmm. Mildred Bailey. Red Norvo, they were married at that time, and um, so we started to play together, and um, you know, it was, everything sort of came very naturally. I mean, it came naturally, and uh, uh, so um, 
I don't, I, I don't know whose idea it was. Uh, we got the Gene group, I think, had been playing with me. And we decided to get Gene, and I was recording with the Victor Company, and we went in and made these slides. Um, um, Body and Soul, and After You're Gone, I think. It was you and Teddy Wilson and Gene Krupa. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, was, it, was that the first uh, racially integrated group in uh, yes, that period? Yes, I guess so. In certainly that appeared before the public. Mm -hmm. And then he came out to join me out in Chicago at a later date. And we did this little floor show on the, on the uh, dance floor. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was just a trio, uh, Teddy and I and Gene. And, uh, and then on one of our trips to Lionel, California. Lionel Hampton next now, tell me that. On uh, one of our trips to uh, California, I think again it was John, who'd um, heard Lionel play at some Central Avenue cafe. He was bottle washer, <laughs> chief cook, and played the vibraphones. So we went out to see him one, uh, one evening after work, and we sort of sat in with him. And that fitted very well, so we asked him to join. Um, I don't think he joined us until we went back to New York and after we'd opened up at the Pennsylvania Hotel. And then we were together for quite a while after that. Another piece of history. Every band then decided it had to have a small group. <laughs> the Clambake Seven and the this and the that. They all had them. Well, I never thought about it that way. Well, they all copied you. Well, could be. They got yeah. one horn of some kind yeah. and a couple of rhythm players yeah. and gave it a name and came out front. They were all copying you. Yeah, could have been. Highly successful. You made a lot of good records with a trio and a quartet. Yes. Yeah, one, excellent. Well, there again, you were talking about chamber music. You know, they were great together. Now, here's a question I would like to have your answer to. I'm not sure that anybody can answer it to the complete satisfaction of anybody. How would you define swing? We, we think we know what jazz is. What is swing? Well, I, I, I guess if I'm going to try to define it, I guess it's a term for... Uh, for I, well, they, they, they use it, in, uh, when I say they, uh, everybody uses it in some kind of context now, or did, when well, does this swing, and meaning does it move, does it have a real tempo, tempo to it, you know, whether it's uh, rock music, I guess, or, or jazz, and uh, whatever it is, you know, I think, uh, what they're really saying about swing is, is it on fire, really? Is it exciting? Exciting, yes. Yeah. You're getting everything out of it. Does a swing tune have to be up-tempo? Not necessarily. It can be medium. Mm -hmm. I suppose it could be the blues. That could swing. So, how would you say? It's music that has a good beat. It's good exciting. Beat. Exciting, yes. And sort of fulfilled. One person can play it one time and doesn't get any plays. <laughs> and really, there's not much terrific content to uh, pop music, is there? Not really, in the sense that you have content in classical music. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. No. Maybe you're right. <laughs> you mean some of Gershwin pieces and things like that. Well, a lot of Gershwin, them. yes, but yeah. they do. some of those uh, arrangements of Fletcher Henderson, well, yes. I think, can stand with any music. I, well, I, I, I agree with you. I agree I'm with glad you. I persuaded you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I was talking about tunes, but Fletcher had a knack of arranging. So something did swing. You know, he interpreted it like it could swing, you see. He wouldn't attempt it with something like uh, The Man I Love. I don't think he would. It's a beautiful melody, you see. You have just made a movie soundtrack, I believe. Is that right? Yes. What uh, movie is it? It's well, it's a, a movie called Phantom of Love that never got to America for some reason, but... Uh, what was uh, it Italian? Italian. Yeah, it's had two good people in it, too, um, um, I think about them. And 
this um, Italian publisher called me at one time, some uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, asked me if I'd make the uh, music to a film they were putting out. And they flew all the way over here to play these songs for me. Mm -hmm. It was rather kind of funny because he was up in my apartment and um, he'd written some very good songs, one particular called Moore. It was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. A fellow named Reese Ortolani. Um, and he was here with his publisher. And I was particularly interested because my daughter was leaving, living in Florence at the time. And I said, well, that's a good way to get there. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I stopped off in Florence first. And then I went to Rome. And they had this orchestra, a big symphony orchestra. And by this time, I was kind of acquainted with the tunes. And we went in the recording studio. And it seemed to tick. As a matter of fact, I can play the record for you. Well, play, you got the horn there. Let well, me I'll try. Put it up so I can hear it. Benny, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You were wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.